Hello everyone. Namaste. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening. I hope you are doing all great. Well, it's evening here in Nepal and we are here back again with brand new episode of webinar on disaster risk reduction and management. This is me, Suraj Gautam, a civil engineer and a disaster risk reduction professional from Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all in our Himalayan webinar series. Well, IHRR is, a, uh, is an organization established with a vision of preparing risk informed societies for disaster resilience and sustainable development. So to contribute onto this, IHRR has been regularly organizing Himalayan webinar series on disaster risk reduction and management and geoscience for sustainable development. So far, we have successfully organized five episodes of webinar on disaster risk reduction and management. And yes, it's the turn for the sixth one. And today we'll be having interesting topic, a very uh, recommended topic, which we got from our webinar feedback survey. So the topic is a nature based solution for sustainable risk reduction, which will be presented by Dr. Karen Sudmar Ricks and uh, Dr. Indrajit Paul. On behalf of the organizing team, we are really grateful to our presenters who will be sharing us with their insights and healthy experiences. So it is indeed an honor to welcome our presenter, Dr. Uh, Karen Sirmai Ricks, who is Senior Advisor at Disaster Risk Reduction Crisis Management Branch, United Nations Environment Program, Geneva, Switzerland. And similarly, we have Dr. Indrajit Paul, who is Assistant Professor and Chair at Disaster Preparedness, Mitigation and Management, Asian Institute of Technology, uh, Patham Thani, Thailand. Uh, to make this session more interactive and lively, we have uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Basantaraj Adhikari from Institute of, Himal uh, Institute of Engineering, Thiruvan University. And uh, as a uh, session moderator, he will be uh, uh, moderating the session for today. And he's also the visiting scientist at Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction. We would like to welcome all of our participants and regular attendees who are joining us through our social media live streaming and also through this Zoom chat, uh, Zoom platform. And we are very pleased to share that uh, we have had a very good number of webinar registrations. So, so far we have uh, around 207 registrations from different parts of the globe. Our, uh, this webinar event has also been featured in Relief Web and Prevention Web website. So to address this huge request, we are also going live on our social media page of Institute of Himalayan Bricks Reduction. Uh, we'll be receiving the queries and feedbacks both from our social media as well as from our Zoom chat box. And uh, we have been organizing this webinar series on disaster risk reduction and management on a regular basis. We believe this webinar series has been supporting our early career scientists, DRRM professionals, academicians and all the participants. So before starting our session for today, I would like to share some brief introduction about Institute of Himalayan Bricks Reduction. Uh, IHRR is a research institute uh, established with an objective to assess and understand the bricks to contribute for the sustainability. And uh, IHRR works under the four thematic areas, uh, DRRM consulting, uh, research and development, disaster academy and youth in disaster risk reduction and management and our team consists of professionals who are uh, working in the field of drr and in understanding the risks conducting academic research and field level implementations in nepal and across the globe so far we have uh, accomplished a number of projects uh, that includes our uh, participation uh, in the COVID-19 response where we had a collaborative approach and we uh, supported in the development of national platform uh, for this information dissemination. Besides, we have also been working in the uh, drone surveying of uh, core area, uh, urban core area uh, that was in Hetora sub metropolitan city. Uh, we have already captured 120 square kilometers of area during this survey. And uh, besides, we our uh, work has also been uh, featured in Sendai voluntary commitment and we are working to achieve the deliverable of this commitment uh, and also we have been regularly organizing this Himalayan webinar series uh, under the two themes as I've already mentioned and uh, so here today we are here on this uh, nature-based solution for sustainable risk reduction and uh, without any delay like I would like to share some households for this webinar uh, the audio and video of the participants uh, will be switched off 
Uh, the overall session of this webinar will be recorded and will later be provided in the uh, YouTube channel. And uh, for any queries, participants can write up in the chat box or in the comment section of the Facebook streaming live. And the waiting room has been enabled and registered users with their original identity will be allowed to enter the webinar room. And uh, I would like to also request our participants to please use their original name as uh, mentioned in the register link. And uh, uh, our participants are also strictly uh, requested uh, to avoid using the annotations. Uh, the feedback, feedback links will be provided during the session and will be providing uh, the participation certificates as well. So without any delay, I would like to now move on uh, to our session. And uh, may I request Dr. Basanta Raj Adhikari to please uh, proceed further with his uh, moderation. Thank you for now. Dr. Basanta. Uh, thank you, Suraj. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. You are audible. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Um, wonderful start. And hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Different part of the world. And I can see lots of uh, our colleagues have already joined from Asia, uh, uh, Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, mostly covering all the all of, around the globe. So we saw that uh, this nature-based solution has a strong impact uh, to the society, uh, which is the emerging, not actually emerging field, but uh, also one alternative and eco-friendly uh, solution uh, for sustainable risk reduction, ecosystem restoration, paying for ecosystem services, uh, eco-DRR. So there are a couple of you know, terms that you can coin uh, for this uh, thing. And then uh, we thought that uh, you know, it's good time to discuss about this nature-based solution uh, or ecosystem-based adaptation in sustainable uh, risk reduction uh, in different parts of the globe. And we really wanted to hear uh, the different examples that people or scientists are practicing in different parts of the world, in different parts of the mountains, uh, starting from Himalayas, Andes, Alps, Rockies, Appalachian Mountain, Tanzania, or in other parts of this uh, globe. So that's why, uh, we have requested our esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Karin Sudmaya and Dr. Indrajit Paul, uh, who are working on this field and uh, uh, has extensive uh, experience uh, in this field uh, for a long time. And then, uh, so I'm pretty much sure that today we'll have a great discussion about uh, the issues, challenges, opportunities, and there are a couple of initiatives that we have already started and that have already started about this initiative. And uh, Karin most probably will present some of the new initiative and uh, the course uh, about this NBS and others uh, in her presentation. Uh, so uh, first I would like to invite uh, Dr. Indrajit Paul for his uh, presentation. Uh, he's assistant professor and chair, disaster preparedness, mitigation and management at DPMM, Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. So I met uh, Dr. Paul uh, long back and we are working together uh, in this field. So he has more than 18 years of experience on research, teaching, training, advocacy, consultancy, you know, primarily focus on disaster risk, governance, hazard and risk assessment, risk perceptions, community-based disaster risk management, public health risks, GIS and remote sensing in disaster risk management, public health assessment, and climate change asset adaptation. And he is quite uh, active and quite helpful, but along with, uh, he has published a number of books and research articles, uh, both uh, you know, in uh, reputed journals and national journals. And he, he is an international person, so I don't know if I say national, then it will not be a good. So he has published lots of papers in international arena. And he's a member uh, of board of director for the Global Alliance of Disaster Risk Institutes, 
which is commonly known as Gadri, Japan. And I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Indrajit Paul accepted our invitation today, where he will present sustainable development and resilient communities, where he will give uh, you know, some of the examples uh, from the Asia Pacific and explaining these challenges and opportunities. So Dr. Paul, please proceed. Yeah, thank you, Basanta. So it's a quite a humble sort of uh, introduction and quite long. Uh, yes, thank you so much for this opportunity. And uh, yes, uh, Basanta and me are working for a long time. And also uh, Karin and also we are also working for some of the uh, book chapters for, for a couple of times. And I think we also know each other at least three, four years time for, from now. Uh, I'll be presenting a uh, few examples as well, like case studies across the globe, like uh, primarily from Southeast Asia. So let's start. Uh, so we have 30 minutes, right, Basanta? Almost? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. So I'll try to make as uh, short as possible or as quick as possible. This is the brief uh, uh, from my one page CV. I try to accommodate, but uh, the point of uh, already Basanta mentioned everything. Uh, one uh, important component I would like to mention here, I'm uh, working on presently uh, two broad projects. One is uh, that uh, UKRI GCRF project, that is Global Ch Challenge Fund uh, by uh, UK Research and Innovation Fund. And that is primarily focusing on the uh, Delta. In Southeast Asia and Delta, we are focusing on four deltas. Uh, although it's not mountain, but the pattern of uh, ecosystem approach is also very much there. And I'm also very much uh, focusing on the risk characterization uh, in these uh, deltas. It's a long-term project for five years. So this is, I'm one of the co-PI for this project. So that just to mention about, I, I'll also give you some insight about this project as well. Another one, like uh, we are heavily involved in ProsperNet uh, higher education uh, in SFDRR and SDG in Asian context. As uh, Basanta mentioned already, I am from uh, DPMM, Disaster Preparedness Mitigation and Management. I can see also a few participants from AIT as well, uh, although I don't know uh, all participants right now. Uh, so that program actually we are um, imparting on the interdisciplinary approach like uh, science, uh, social science and natural science together. So I'll start with the sustainable development uh, agenda and goals. Uh, we are very much familiar with the 17 goals of SDG, uh, UN SDGs. So I, I would like to uh, put one point here what to, to start with on the resilience. So by definition, development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. That is very, very contextual. Right now, uh, the situation is not uh, um, very sort of conducive. Most of the time we are trying to meet our immediate need. We don't think about the future need too much. So we are trying to put in a short term basis, any plans or anything. And that is the first problem starting with the first challenge also starting for the uh, sustainable development. So we should plan something uh, which uh, is, is like, like for the long term, it should be sustainable. And we should think about the future prospect as well. So we'll try to understand something a nature based approach is one of the a critical component in this, this juncture. Uh, when we are talking about the sustainability, there are three components uh, theoretically. And uh, it's not theoretically, it's also practically. We'll start with the environment and that is the uh, baseline. We are thinking about the eco-DRR approach. And eco-DRR approach is primarily focusing on one of the major pillar of sustainability, that is environment. Uh, so that's why I put this, this is a very important and interesting sort of figure for three pillars. So when you talk about the environment, so this, there is a nexus called en environment, social and economic uh, nexus. Everything is functioning that sustainability is you know, within these three triangle or three pillar. So if one of the things are disturbed, like say for example, unsustainable development or long-term not non-sustainable development, then possibly the environment will be disturbed and the one pillar is, is uh, not that stable. So obviously the social and economic also will be impacted.
this is one of the figure I also used to teach in my classroom as well. Like I love this picture and uh, this toy is called the roly poly toy and is one of the great example for the resilience. When somebody is pushing you, I mean pushing that toy that is falling down and is coming back very fast. So that is also signifying the resilience of the community, resilience of that, that society or even individual as well. So we can define that resilience in the context of how faster, how, how quick that group of people, that community or the system can come back to the normal situation. That we define as a resilience. In Chinese and Japanese community, bamboo is one of the uh, sort of um, icon uh, things. Of, I mean, they are, they are thinking as a resilience uh, indicator or as a symbol of resilience. So when the snow, uh, snow time, the bamboo trees are going down, it's bending, but it's not dying. So uh, in, in summertime, it's again coming back to its normal position. This is also one of the great example for resilience. This is a very common term, uh, common curve actually. Uh, I'm starting with this uh, initial part and then we'll slowly phase uh, down to that uh, examples of case studies uh, from a couple of uh, countries. When the main acceptable level of functionality during and after disruptive events uh, and it's, it's not recovering fully. That part actually is the common point where resilience concept is starting. So when we have good resilience, that curve will come much faster. That come, curve will come on the base level or on the stabilized level much faster. So this is one of the interesting uh, figure if you can explore. And after that, there are many explanations of this particular figure and there are more, more modifications also. Once we know about the resilience, then we have to think about the community resilience because any disaster, any, any sort of hazards which is uh, affecting the poor community and that part we need to focus much on the community resilience. So it is, it is true for the mountain, it is true for the plain and it's also true for the coastal areas. Is, is true for everywhere almost. So it refers to the existence, development and engagement of the local resources. And at the same time, also if you can see the resource management for the local community, uh, in, in Bangladesh also we have seen there are many, many examples where people are using local resources as a part of the community resilience and it, it can also be sustainable. I'll, I'll show you some pictures as well after a few slides. Now coming back to the, I mentioned like I will discuss about the challenges. What are the challenges? Why we are not uh, following the exact uh, resilience path? So where we are uh, achieving our uh, resilience path properly or not? That, that we should uh, understand. And if not, then what are the challenges we should face? We are facing. So the first challenge is there are a few uh, points, broad points we have to try to cover, uh, cover here. One is the increasing proportion of the climate related disasters. So when it comes down to the climate related uh, hazards or disasters, then uh, there are there are many uh, group of people or many schools having like climate change also one of the factors which is uh, now frequency and impacts are increasing day by day. Second point is increasing economic impact. So since our infrastructure or different type of infrastructure cost is increasing, or other costs are also increasing, impacts are also increasing in the economic term, apart from your other terms. Say for example, in present context of COVID, if we see there is no physical loss, there's no physical damage per se, but there is a huge economic loss in different, different uh, contexts. Third one, more people are being exposed as a population increased. And uh, also we know from 2007 onward, the urban population increased uh, much more than the a rural population. Now the more than 50% of the population of the globe are residing in, in uh, located in the city. So city is more compacted and more uh, exposed. So if there is a similar type of hazard which has um, happened like long back, we have more exposure than before for the same type of hazards because the population density and the migration of the population increased a lot. Fourth point is more risk complexity. Now the multiple risk also increased and the complexity of the particular risk also increased. So these are the various challenges we are facing and also continuing environmental degradation. We are not following the uh, standard pattern of environmental process. So environmental degradation is also one of the key factors uh, for this we can consider. So that's why if you see the uh, global data, 
global data shows like majority of the disasters, majority of the disasters happening for last 20 years are primarily climate induced hazards. There are some geophysical hazards, but the death and the other losses are not that much like climate induced hazards. So climate change is also uh, uh, creating more complex uh, system into uh, whole whole process. On the right side picture, I categorically mentioned like in the Himalayan uh, states, uh, this picture is particularly uh, from one of the states in India. Uh, I believe that like there are many uh, similar examples also uh, present in the Nepal. Um, unorganized or unplanned uh, sort of infrastructure. And this is one of the major cause for the exposure, uh, increase of the exposure. And, and this also major challenge, whether it's intentional or unintentional, that is a matter of debate. And then we can discuss about that exposure context as well. So this is primarily increasing the vulnerability of that particular group, which can lead to the disaster as well. And there are many examples from Nepal, I'm sure like uh, for the landslide as well as the flash flood. This is one of the example from uh, Uttarakhand, uh, India. Uh, in 2013, there was a huge flash flood. The location you can see I have just showed in the previous picture. And these are also the photographs from the same uh, location, similar location, the same state. So in 2013, there was a huge death toll uh, due to the flash flood. I don't know who, what you call it's a natural disaster or man-made disaster. So normally by the classification it's a natural origin, but we can also consider as a man-made disaster because there is no role for the nature to play here because everyone is concentrating here in completely unorganized and on the flood plains. Now the most interesting component is what are the opportunities out of that? We all are now we are discussing about the different challenges. So first one is the what we have seen the underlying factors for that whole risk process or the risk system. There are a few components which we should uh, consider. One of that components are uh, is like uh, the poverty. So we can uh, alleviate the poverty a certain extent or try to alleviate the poverty so that uh, the, the awareness and also the capacity can be increased need for inclusion and empowerment of the com uh, community which are marginalized which are uh, sort of not getting proper sort of address from the government or from the community we can also take on board them and also the decision making process decision making process should be more and more participatory so the participatory process can increase the confidence and increase the preparedness process and, the, and develop the capacity of the community that can slowly increase the uh, resilience of the community as well and the last point is very much uh, interesting as well as uh, sort of conflicting as well. Using technological innovation for the smart resilience. I'm not sure how many of you are aware about in this group about the uh, mobile or uh, mobile penetration in the Southeast Asia. Right now, Max, most of the things are very much depends on the mobile uh, system or the internet system, but the internet penetration in the in the entire East Asia or the entire Asia, uh, if you consider it's not uh, more than 60%. So the 40% people still uh, are out of the network, right? So in the process, present process also is very much crucial in the COVID system and non-COVID system also. If we want to make the resilient system in, in, in which includes the technology, technological innovation, I think it's also necessary to see the mobile penetration and digital divide should be uh, reduced. We have one example. Around the world, you know, children in school facilities are a special category of people at risk. Three countries were selected you know, under this project, Vietnam, Thailand and Bangladesh. It is about the continuation of you know, the school education, particularly after the uh, disaster and particularly after flooding and water logging. School education is a backbone of the country. Uh, you know, it's a very big city, very unmanageable. Yeah, this is one of the small examples from Thailand. We, we, are, or, uh, we ran one project for, to understand the school resilience uh, process. This is a very uh, interesting example from uh, one of the provinces in Thailand that is very frequently flooded every year almost. So we visited the 
school uh, under this project during the flood. So this is the time of the flood. You can see uh, water all over the school. This is a school building. This one is a school building, but the school is going on as normal as like non-flood time. I Means school is completely resilient. There is no disruption in the education uh, during the flood time also. And this type of structure, steel structure, about eight to 10 feet from the base level. They have constructed 43 years before. So it's not very recent. So they're quite resilient for the flood. They have, they have analyzed the location. So the exposure is very high for the flood. So the school become resilient. There are offices, corridors, uh, the pathways, everything is sort of constructed in a way so that it can, it will not be affected during the normal flood time. So if it is extreme flood situation, maybe the school will be closed. But this was also flood, flood situation, not very extreme, but moderate level flood can, school can continue. But that picture, I, I don't know, like it's not very much common in, we have studied three countries, Vietnam and Bangladesh and Thailand. Uh, in other two countries, situations are, the comparison is, uh, is uh, different. It's not that resilient school we have seen, but we have seen other, other examples as well. Uh, this is another example from the community side. It, it is applicable for Nepal uh, context in Tarai region because it's uh, very frequently flooded. We have visited recently, I mean, before just before the COVID uh, end of last year um, in, in Vietnam, especially in Cha, um, Chafara River Basin uh, level, it's Mekong Delta region actually. I mean, it's Mekong, not Chafara, Mekong Delta region, almost southern tip. So we have seen the flood resilient crop for the in the in the recent process of the flooding system, uh, this crop is is actually we call floating rice. So during the flood, that that uh, type of rice, that variety of rice, can sustain about eight to ten feet of water uh, at least for four weeks. So this is one of the uh, good intervention we have seen. And add on to that, we have also seen this type of houses in the same location. Just background, you can see there are many uh, sort of paddy fields, same uh, floating rice. And this building is also called the amphibian house. Normal time, the building is look like this. It's very simple uh, sort of process or simple technology. They have used many uh, plastic jerry cans, blank. So in the flood time, the, that whole house can float. So that's why it's called amphibian house. So that during the flood time, that house is uh, become floating house with the floating rice. So the person who is guiding this, uh, guarding that uh, ground can also, also stay here in this house. So this is a very interesting project and is, is they're practicing in Vietnam, part of the Vietnam they're practicing. And also I think there, uh, there are a few examples in Indonesia as well. Okay. Uh, there's one more example from Chafara River Basin that is in, uh, Vietnam, in, in Thailand, very close to Bangkok. Um, central part. Uh, we have mangrove plantation here. We used to visit uh, this uh, particular location. If you see, this is a mangrove forest school. This location, this particular community, they have started the community-based approach for the mangrove plantation and also reclaiming the land. So they are trying to reclaim the land with some a bamboo fencing process. And at the same time, they're also planting uh, the, um, the sapling of uh, mangroves. So the mangrove um, jungle is also increasing. The mangrove forest is also increasing. At the same time, uh, erosion is also restricted because of that plantation. There are many ways they have done and it's a 100% uh, sort of nature-based. And it's, it's an excellent project. We really encourage that project. And many of the CSR activity also right now focused in that particular project as well. So these are our students, actually, one of the student visit uh, last year, um, we have organized. Uh, uh, similar thing, I mean, we can see, this is also act as a flood control measures because um, of the mangrove plantation as well as the bamboo forest. Um, this is the architecture they are following in the when they are putting the bamboos. These are dots are actually the point of the bamboo, uh, putting that bamboo in this row. So this actually is arresting the the webs, and when the webs are arrested, that uh, sediment uh, rate, sedimentation rate also will be increasing. So when the sedimentation rate will increase, that uh, this land also going to uh, increase from the uh, coastal side. 
and in the left side these are the saplings of uh, mangroves and the bamboo as well so they are growing uh, uh, i mean mostly they are uh, the saplings they are growing for the mangroves and they are putting the mangroves like this and this is very interesting project this is the project i was mentioning about the living delta we call we are trying to understand the socio ecological system of the delta uh, of three deltas so these are the areas actually this is called gbm delta and uh, this is our project area which falls partly in bangladesh partly in india uh, this is uh, in uh, near to ho chi minh city this is um, uh, one delta here and mekong delta and this one is the red delta red river delta so these are the three deltas primary in four uh, location we are concentrating in the whole process actually of this delta resilience understanding the delta resilience we will try to understand about the this project started last year um, community based disaster resilience and how the community is uh, reacting to the different uh, multiple hazards and as well as what are the coping capacity of the community and how they are handling that uh, present uh, disasters and what are the plan for the next so we can understand the whole system we are approaching uh through the physical uh, model also we are trying to develop the numerical model and also some sort of uh, social based approach also so there are multi prong approach we are doing the uh, 30 plus universities together this is very interesting to understand the three different type of infrastructure in the delta system like green gray and hybrid solutions could be green gray and the blue infrastructure is the three different types of infrastructure and if we can understand the the, the mitigational process uh, to restrict or arrest the sedimentation i mean arrest the erosion component so i think green and gray or hybrid solution is one of the uh, interesting people are right now using this is one of the activities uh, using the uh, natural resilience we have uh, taken it from the, that uh, wood logs they are using uh, to uh, see embankment in sundarbans that is a mangrove area southern part of uh, of india and bangladesh and these are the uh, completely nature based not only nature based is also uh, approach this photographs uh, i have taken during our last field visit uh, last year in in october sometime Uh, so this one actually they have used the local materials is not only co low cost is also environment friendly and also giving the livelihood options for the local people as well so this is interesting project in multi multi sense this is creating their uh, mitigational uh, measures for uh, their islands and their delta as well as is low cost constructed by the local materials so local people are getting livelihoods as well but the point is since it's a project not completely owned by the community sometimes the poor maintenance is uh, is a problem for the longer term so that's why the the sustainable component is coming okay so these are the community role uh, in in two component we can understand here one is the engagement of the community uh, so this is not the normal regular activity this is one of the uh, sort of activity uh, for, for a particular occasion so is mangrove plantation they are doing so i'll i'll stop here with this examples these are the different partners right now we are working uh, last year also last two years we are working with uh, wwf i think un uh, karin will uh, in the next presentation will obviously explain about the un activities uh, at the same time we are also working with the wwf on the eco dr approach they are also uh, one of the approaches like um, green flood guide uh, so the green solution for the flood mitigation that is also coming up uh, very nicely so uh, thank you so much for your attention so i'll be happy to respond to your questions thanks thank you dr paul for your uh, uh, wonderful and enlightened presentation and you know the importance of uh, sustainable risk reduction with the help of eco grr and nature based solution or you know different uh, examples that you have presented from south east asia including uh, uh, you know vietnam and then you showed some of the pictures of india also so you know that are the common challenges that we are um, 
you know, facing uh, in Asia Pacific region. Uh, wonderful presentation, and I'm pretty much sure that there must be lots of questions uh, both in Zoom chat box and Facebook. Uh, can you just close your uh, slide, sure. Dr. Paul? Sure. And uh, please be with us uh, so that, uh, but in the meantime, you can just go through the questions that uh, our participant has already uh, written over there. And now uh, let me introduce our uh, another esteemed colleague, Dr. Karin Sudmia Riggs. Uh, she's a very good friend of mine, a good friend of uh, Nepal, and she's uh, everywhere. I mean, she's quite famous in Nepal, but she's more famous uh, in other part of the world. Uh, she's a senior advisor, disaster risk reduction with uh, the United Nations Environmental Program, UNEP, disaster and conflict program in Geneva, Switzerland. So she holds a PhD in environmental science from the University of Lausanne, uh, Switzerland, and a master's degree in the international development and forest ecology uh, from Switzerland and the United States. She has over a decade of experience researching, teaching, publishing uh, on EcoDRR, and currently she is coordinating a global project on EcoDRR, which includes the development of ma the postgraduate course and two master massive open online course on this topic, which is uh, you know very very popular uh, in different part of the world. Uh, probably she will uh, talk later on a little bit, but uh, you know. Uh, before I introduce uh, her uh, talk today, uh, she's you know uh, quite uh, she has a quite extensive experience on EcoSafe Road, uh, on ecosystem-based adaptation in Nepal. Uh, that's how I met her uh, already five years before, and we are working together. And not only in Nepal, but also we have conducted program on this EcoDRR in Indonesia and uh, Nairobi. Uh, so. And we have requested her to give a presentation and to share her experiences on uh, this natural-based solution. And then, you know, uh, the urban issues now, when you talk about urban uh, sustainable cities, are, you know, there are lots of initiative about, uh, you know, cities, because if you read the, you know, the report of old bank, so more people will be shifted from, uh, rural to urban areas in this to come or next dec decade. So there are lots of you know urban issues, the issues between the 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 you know subsidence, the landslides, or the you know different uh, like uh, waste are different, and the between differences between urban reach and urban poor. So today she will uh, explain or share her experiences on opportunities for exploring nature-based solutions to urban. DR challenges. Uh, I'm pretty much sure that she'll uh, give lots of examples around the globe. So, uh, Dr. Corey, uh, the floor is yours. Please proceed. Let me just uh, turn on my video for a minute, if uh, you will allow. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, can you see me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, first I want to say namaskar and thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this very exciting uh, webinar series. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm famous in Nepal, but I am definitely a fan of Nepal and um, of course a bit frustrated right now that uh, we're not allowed to travel to see our good colleagues in person, but kegarne, right? We have what to do. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, thanks again, Namaskar, and uh, hello to participants from around the world. I see some good friends. Also there, Sanjay Devkota has joined. Uh, so thank you. Let me uh, share my screen and hope that it works. Can you see now? Not yet. My... Not, not yet. Not. Okay. Here. Now, let's see. Hopefully, I'm successful. Yes. 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 Then perfect. I can probably, yeah, perfect. Okay. So I'll go ahead. So thank you again. Um, I thought that your topic was more focused on urban. 
So I decided that I would not necessarily present so much on what our project is on right now, but rather related to challenges and opportunities. Yeah, can uh, you make a presentation more, Karin? Should I make it uh, full screen? Yeah, yeah. Now it's better? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, this is an overview of uh, my topic, and um, I'll also try at the very end of uh, my presentation to also give a little bit more information on the project that we're working on currently, and where you can find more information as well. Um, so here's the overview is why are ecosystems important to disaster risk and adaptation? I'm going to build on the very excellent presentation that was just given by Dr. Paul. Um, let me talk more specifically about urban areas, some specific challenges and opportunities. And I also want to give some information and, and some excitement and ideas to our colleagues and uh, young and older colleagues from around the world who are looking at how they can evolve in this very interesting and exciting growing field. So uh, why are ecosystems important to disaster risk and adaptation? Well, building on the very interesting talk we just heard from, from our colleague, you know, this is a photo that I often use when uh, we start any of our courses or lectures. And it's a very, I would say, uh, it's very illustrative of what we mean by the eco and the eco and DRR. This is the border between co two countries. Can you see? Look at the huge difference here. Here we have Haiti and here we have Dominican Republic. And what happened is in 2004, we had a huge storm, Hurricane Jeanne, that hit the island in the same way. And actually it hit the Dominican Republic first. But the way the disaster panned out was that there were 6,000 casualties in Haiti, only 18 casualties in Dominican Republic. And most of those casualties in Dominican Republic were actually people who lived right on the border between Haiti and Dominican Republic. So you can see how by managing our ecosystem or not managing our ecosystem, we really are creating risk to ourselves. So I never say, I never use the term natural disasters because in most cases we create the disasters ourselves by how we mismanage either our ecosystems or the way the disaster, the hazard event itself plays out. Here's another example that I use a lot, which comes from our colleague, uh, Brian, who's uh, currently in, in Singapore. He uh, was at, in the tsunami area uh, after the Indian Ocean in Sri Lanka one year afterwards. And he noticed something really interesting. He said, here is a natural area, the Niala National Park, where there's actually, you can hardly see an ecotourism resort. You can just see the rooftops. What happened when a seven meter wave came through? There was only five centimeters of water that hit this ecotourism resort. And seven meter wave, however, hit this Yala Safari Resort, which had removed the sand dunes for better ocean views. Okay, so this is a man-made disaster where we're removing the sand dunes, our natural protection, our natural buffer for better ocean views, and 727 people lost their lives. So over the past decade, our group, the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction, and me working with UNEP and the universities, have been studying this phenomenon. And we've been asking ourselves, to what extent can ecosystems reduce disaster risk and avoid conflicts? We know that, but we need to know more. We need a better quantification of how much of a buffer do we need? How effective will this ecosystem be? And how to undertake protection? So we have been gathering evidence over the last decade and trying to make it more, I would say, communication friendly so that we can communicate with policymakers and convince them that they need to invest more in ecosystems for disaster risk reduction. Now, uh, Basanta, you started out the, the conversation by mentioning several terms. Uh, I've heard you use ecosystem-based um, disaster risk reduction. I've heard you use nature-based solutions. So I don't know if you can see this very well on your screens, but this is an um, infographic that we've just developed where we try to show now how this field has evolved we're talking more and more about nature-based solutions for sustainable development. And that includes both disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, um, but also environmental management and climate change mitigation. So sometimes you hear about ecosystem-based uh, ecosystem disaster risk reduction, eco-DRR, 
You may hear about ecosystem-based adaptation or EBA. I mean, it's all, it's an umbrella term and it's all the same family on various ends of the spectrum. So some of the ways uh, how we do this is, uh, uh, so some of the main goals are meeting the needs of people, it's dealing with climate change, um, and it's also making sure that we're taking care of the planet for the long term. Those are the three overriding goals. We do that through, through various approaches. Uh, Dr. Paula mentioned green infrastructure. We also talk about blue infrastructure, wetlands and restoration, landscape restoration, climate smart agriculture, urban greening, sustainable land management, integrated water resource management, integrated coastal zone management, and protected areas. And I'm sure all of you who have joined this webinar today work on various parts of uh, this infographic uh, to various degrees. Uh, so today I'll focus more on the parts that relate to green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, and urban greening. But I hope you find this infographic useful in having an overview of the topic. So specific challenges and opportunities related to urban areas. Well, I often like to use this uh, satellite, these two satellite images that um, I put in all of, most of my lectures to better understand, well, what are some of the challenges and what are some of the underlying risk factors and causes of risk? Actually, I was working with our colleague Sanjay Devkota, who's in the webinar. We were working in the, in the Duran uh, region of Eastern Nepal. And uh, my students uh, pointed out saying, Dr. Karen, Dr. Karen, look what happened over five years. Settlements, people had moved into the floodplain, actually. And when we interviewed these people, they're mainly living in this uh, small kind of shanty uh, houses, uh, shacks, also the photo that Dr. Paul showed from Vietnam. Well, these people had moved down from the hillsides, from the landslide affected areas, seeking better opportunities for their children, better job opportunities. And when we say, if we say that climate change is creating disasters, well, don't always believe that you hear that climate change is the main cause of disasters. No, it's urban planning. It's these people who should not be living in this dangerous place. It's a lack of governance. So let's just be very careful when we talk about what are the urban challenges and how they're caused. So I also saw that heard that Dr. Paul mentioned some of the uh, issues specifically related to urban challenges. So we know that a, a large proportion of the world's population is living in urban areas and even more will be living in urban areas by 2030. The world contains more than 400 cities with 1 million or more inhabitants. And some of the specific challenges to urban areas is that we have then more people involved due to higher uh, density. And cities, where are they located? They're located in areas that are naturally hazard prone. They're located along rivers, they're located along coasts, because this is where people easily find livelihoods. And this is also where they're more disaster prone. So we have a multitude of different challenges, and also, especially in the global south, where we have, we may have more marginal groups uh, in shanty towns in the outskirts of many of our cities. So again, when we look at climate change, uh, I say that they're exasperated exacerbated, not caused uh, by climate change. But of course, according to IPCC, the uh, International Panel for Climate Change, uh, they are worse than by climate change. You see these main uh, hazards, sea level rise, tropical cyclones, flooding and landslides, water quality and shortage, heat and cold waves. Many of them are being amplified by climate change, uh, not all. Um, so anyway, you can see here also some of the additional risks uh, related to possible urban fires, uh, negative impacts on productivity of fisheries, worsening urban air uh, quality and pollution, and the enhanced effects of urban heat islands. So these are some of the additional uh, challenges that we will see in future years uh, due to climate change. So uh, most of us do live in urban areas, uh, and if we don't, we should be very concerned about our nearby urban areas because this is where a lot of the economic activity for all of our countries is located. I think this map here is quite interesting if you can read it properly. So this shows urbanization in low elevation coastal areas and we see that in many cases uh, some of the uh, many of the urban uh, uh, some of the uh, the coastal ecosystems have been um, 
have been impacted uh, by, um, by uh, ecosystem degradation. And uh, it also shows that um, many of these uh, urban areas will be impacted by sea level rise and should be very concerned. But when it comes down to understanding how to manage risk in urban areas, and especially we'll talk about ecosystems here in a minute, one of the main challenges is man managing trade-offs. Of course, people need to live somewhere, right? Um, and we want to know, well, where can this urban area expand? How to allow for future urban development? How can this be done with the least amount of impacts? And what are some of the trade-offs? When we look at some of the linkages between ecosystems and urban areas, we see that it's, um, you know, there are various cycles. We have the hydrological cycle, where we know that uh, most urban, a lot of urban areas, I believe 20 of the largest uh, cities around the world are dependent on protected areas and nearby watersheds, and protected areas for their water source. So we see the various uh, feedback loops uh, between flood regulation, urban climate regulation, water provision, food provision, and also we have aesthetic and spiritual values related to ecosystems and their benefits for urban areas that we need to keep into account. So of course, if urban areas are polluting, we're polluting uh, the very water that we are uh, living from. And we don't often think about the fact that even if the uh, upper watershed is maybe many kilometers away from the urban area, that is where we need to start looking at when it comes to how to manage some of the hazards that are in urban areas. So managing flooding in an urban area doesn't start at the city boundaries, it starts in the upper watershed. So we often need to take a larger perspective and landscape scale when we look at how to manage urban risk. This slide here shows that uh, urban expansion has had negative consequences on our watersheds. Right? I mean, what happens is that we create impervious structures and surfaces uh, where water is no longer allowed to infiltrate. And this is one of the main problems, actually, is stormwater runoff and how to manage stormwater runoff that becomes polluted. Um, so it's often not actually just the water coming down itself, right, from rainfall, but it's how to, if it doesn't, water doesn't infiltrate, it has to go somewhere. And this is what causes the, the, a lot of the damage. So what we uh, will see now is that all, out of all of these challenges, we actually have, there are some enormous opportunities for working with a new urban renewal and new urban uh, green design that is actually having a, quite a revolution now in our, uh, both in uh, terms of uh, studies and urban design with architects, with city planners, and we're just at the very beginning. So I would really encourage uh, you young people who are getting starting on your PhDs, um, but also in terms of more seasoned uh, researchers, really encourage your students uh, to see how you can be part of this uh, very exciting opportunity that's knocking, that, sh that you can be knocking on doors for. We're seeing now from around the world uh, that even uh, areas that are very difficult to manage, especially dryland areas, this example is from Los Angeles, where urban designers are really trying to figure out how they can manage the uh, very, I would say, unusual rainfall events that come to Los Angeles. It may not rain at all in Los Angeles for many, I would say many years, and all of a sudden they get a huge rainfall and they need to figure out what to do with the water. So even in areas uh, as difficult as Los Angeles with all the impervious surfaces, uh, urban designers are finding ways uh, to manage water. Um, here is another uh, example of how this is being done also in Los Angeles where they are trying to uh, reverse uh, the problem that I mentioned before about impervious surfaces and trying to find areas uh, where they can uh, incorporate bioswales. Uh, so bioswales are a kind of, uh, I would say, natural areas instead of um, paved sidewalks where water can infiltrate and it looks much nicer and it's better for our physical and mental well-being when we can see these nice areas rather than gray uh, infrastructure. Uh, here's some more examples and I'm sure you have seen more also that are popping up around the world 
uh, we're starting to see some of these beautiful uh, green walls. You may have seen one in airports. It may have been a while since you've been to an airport, but the last time I was in airports, I think even uh, Singapore and Amsterdam have some of these beautiful uh, gray walls that uh, not only help purify the air, but they're pleasant to look at and much nicer than having a concrete wall. Uh, more and more there have been uh, installations of uh, green rooftop gardens. And these grew uh, green rooftop gardens, they are not only aesthetically pleasing, but they serve a function, which is to reduce the amount of stormwater, uh, which um, most of our cities are dealing with. Um, in China, uh, there's more talk about what they call sponge cities and the sponge city concept, uh, which I just saw was reported on in the Hindu Times as a possibility for Kochi City, actually, so, which is talking about one of the, the first cities in India, which uh, may want to apply the sponge city concept, uh, which basically is the same thing as looks at how to help water infiltrate uh, so that it has more time for purification, less problems with stormwater runoff, uh, drought reduction. You can see the many benefits uh, for parks, for people's uh, mental and physical well-being. Here's another uh, small, it talks about sponge cities. We also see some of the green rooftops design. Uh, it says here that 30 Chinese cities will each receive, I don't know how many million that is, to Pilot green roofs, constructed wetlands, increased uh, tree cover and permeable pavements to capture, slow down, and filter storm water. Here's one example I just uh, pulled off the internet. Um, maybe somebody knows which city this is from, but uh, Basantaji, you're uh, in China as many times, maybe you know which city this is from, but uh, I didn't uh, actually note which city, but it looks very uh, impressive. And uh, let's take note on what the Chinese are doing and um, think about this when it comes to, if you're part of urban city design, how can you uh, be part of this new revolution? I found this example, uh, which is interesting, from Kathmandu, close to home, for those of you in Nepal. There was apparently a e payment for ecosystem services feasibility uh, study, which was carried out by uh, Forest Action and Isimod with the nearby Shivapuri uh, National Park. Um, now, I don't know if you know about uh, this payment for ecosystem services concept, but basically it's a concept where um, you, water users, it's usually around water, water users actually pay uh, upland users to protect the watershed. So there might be some transfer of payments um, so that the water becomes pure. Now, apparently this concept uh, ne didn't necessarily uh, go much beyond the study uh, stage, but it, it has worked um, in areas like France where the Evian water, which is quite famous, Evian, uh, the uh, water factories has paid farmers, French farmers in the upland area to protect the watershed. Um, but I'm not sure, maybe somebody later on can tell me if this specific example has actually worked in practice. It's often difficult to put into place and there are actually only a very few examples that have worked like I mentioned. Uh, but here the idea is really again think about the landscape. Uh, when you are looking at uh, managing um, urban flood uh, problems, you can't start at the city boundaries. You have to look where the source of the water is and it's often the solutions should be found upstream in many cases. Um, also take a look at this example from the Netherlands. So urban solutions might also be needed to be found at the country scale or at the river basin scale. Uh, this uh, example, making space for water, uh, was a huge project which started in the Netherlands after uh, the Netherlands had been flooded so many times uh, due to very high uh, rainfall events. Now you probably know that the Dutch are so famous for their dikes sea dikes or river dikes. But what they did with this project is they actually, in many cases, they removed many of the dikes. They allowed the rivers to take their natural meandering uh, of, uh, pathway and they encouraged people who live too close to the river, like in Duran, to move away. 
and instead they created recreational areas. This was based on many, actually thousands of public hearings where the Dutch people and people in villages and towns were encouraged to think about this and they agreed actually that they needed to not live so very close to the river. Keep in mind, Netherlands is the third most densely populated country in the world. I think following um, Bangladesh and Taiwan even. So of course they have the means, they're a rich country, but even a very densely populated country managed to allow the rivers to go back to their uh, meandering way. And now actually Kerala is following along the similar model and is doing things similar uh, for the, uh, the Kutanad area. So I want to uh, almost final finish here, but I just want to get one more mes message is that green infrastructure is cost effective. And we're seeing more and more studies. This one is from New York City, where they had to choose between um, renewing their gray infrastructure, their sewage system, which was outdated and was leaking, and they had to replace it. But they did a study and they found that by replacing it with green infrastructure, restored wetlands uh, with bioswales, with green rooftops, it would be cheaper. Plus, the green infrastructure only looks better over time, right? Trees grow, the bioswales get more mature, whereas the green infrastructure we have to replace after 15, 20 years. So finally, opportunities for getting involved. And I want to tell you about the Partnership for Environment and Disaster Risk Reduction, which was established uh, over a decade ago. And we really work on uh, pooling expertise and advocating policy change at the global and the local level. So we really have been bridging science and policy for over a decade. Uh, these are the partners that we work with. Actually, I see some of the same logos that were on, as uh, shown by Dr. Paul. Uh, but we are working with many of the large actors that work on both disaster risk and uh, ecosystems. And I want to show you where you can find, uh, yeah, so our three priorities of work are advancing science knowledge on EcoDR and climate and CCA, strengthening capacities. Uh, we have uh, several, we have a master's course that we have developed. Uh, we had uh, our first massive open online course, which was quite successful with 20,000 people. We're now developing our second uh, MOOC, massive open online course, and we're actually going to be translating it into seven languages, and we hope to have 100,000 people lined up this time around. And uh, we will let you know how you can get more information on that. We do a lot of policy advocacy mainstreaming together. Here are some of our knowledge. We have two uh, peer-reviewed books uh, behind us, many policy briefs, uh, like I said, our master's course, and we have uh, a source book. Uh, this book here, The Role of Ecosystems, is free online. I can be downloaded from our website. This is a source book that you can find. You can also find our master's course on our, our website, and I'll give you the web, uh, the web uh, link in a minute. Uh, and here, finally, you can see our national training course. We have a graduate level course, which is freely available to any university. If you uh, write to me, I can, I'll send it to you. You sign up to be a partner. We've done training of trainers, and I said I mentioned the massive open online courses. We've organized three science policy workshops and uh, we're hoping to organize one next year. We'll see how it goes with COVID, maybe it'll be online. Um, but if you, um, I'll talk in a minute how you can sign up for our newsletter. And here are also some photos of some of the policy work that we have been doing. Uh, we were honored to have the uh, Minister of Disaster Risk from Indonesia visit our booth last year at the Global Platform. And um, we have, we're now working in uh, five countries around the world um, with specific project uh, work here through this project that's funded by the European Union. We're working uh, on the ground in Indonesia, Haiti, Uganda, Ethiopia, and uh, India, uh, in Kerala and three states of the north. And um, finally, let's see here. Let's see. Oops, I don't know what happened to our. Uh, you can find more on this uh, website here, better.org. And uh, that's a good way where you can find out how to sign up for our weekly newsletter on EcoDRR. And we provide announcements on all of our upcoming activities there as well. I'll stop there. I hope I didn't go too much over time. Uh, but thank you for your attention.
uh, thank you, Karin. Uh, can you just close? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So uh, wonderful, Karin, and you are always, you know, good uh, in presentation, showing lots of examples around the globe, which uh, always fascinating. Especially, I like the photo between Haiti and Dominica, where you can, you know, really show the clear difference between forestation and deforestation, and uh, lots of, uh, you know, online courses uh, which has already been successful and uh, you know people will join in this to come um, thank you once again and uh, yes we have received a lot of questions uh, both in uh, zoom chat box and facebook i would uh, request uh, to ask more questions um, so i will start with uh, karin um, that uh, I got a question uh, from Facebook. Nagbindra Tahal, uh, he's asking, uh, yeah, he's uh, writing uh, that all interested speaker, but uh, mostly Karin can address this. So in the similar fashion of the past years, this year to Nepal face a monsoon rain induced disasters from three dimension. Uh, one is lightning, Another one, cloud burst induced landslides, and then the uh, COVID-19 with a multitude effect. Uh, so there are tremendous losses of life and properties. Uh, I mean, we didn't have uh, the clear data. We had to come. You know, what are your uh, not to miss tips that Nepal should add up in the national and sectoral and local level plans in this to go uh, in the future? Karin, can you make some comment on that? Right, so the question is uh, what should Nepal include in its uh, national and local level yeah. uh, planning? Yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I was working in Nepal for about 10 years and uh, we did a lot of uh, capacity building together with government. We worked a lot on what I call strategic environmental assessments. Uh, with the government. And I would say that it really comes down to making sure that you disaster risk reduction includes also proper environmental management but proper land use planning. Now, Nepal is some of the best, I understand, has good codes. And actually, the, even the city of Duran actually has good building codes, good land use plan, but is it implemented? So, I mean, it's good to have things in the plan, sir. I think it was sir who asked the question. And I think you have quite good plans, making sure that they're climate smart, making sure that you include, uh, um, it's called a, a risk um, sensitive land use planning. But you need to implement, you need to make sure the enforcement is there. So you need to find ways to make sure that uh, the governance structures are there. And I know that you have decentralized in recent years that your uh, decentralized government understands the importance of risk sensitive land use planning and incorporates that and enforces it. So I think that would be my recommendation. Thank you for the question. I hope I answered it properly. Yeah, thanks, Karin. Uh, another question uh, from uh, Dara Mopreti. So he's asking, is there internationally agreed definition of nature-based solution? Uh, the first question. Second question, does it cover the scope of sustainable management of forest resources or ecosystem resources, sorry, ecosystem restoration of disturbed landscape? Can you say community forest management in Nepal as an example of uh, NBS? that was once totally deforested in around 1976, and later after many years of community effort management in the forest patches are fully reclaimed and become rich in ecosystem products and services. So can you make comments on this, Karin? Yes, um, in terms of a standard definition of nature-based solutions, actually there are two that are out there. One is by IUCN, so IUCN has developed principles of nature-based solutions. Uh, you can go to their, I'm sure you can Google it, uh, IUCN nature-based solutions. Um, so this is one definition. The other definition that is commonly used is by the European Commission. 
which has a slightly different uh, definition. The definitions differ only by the fact that the European Commission also admits biomimicry. What biomimicry is, is for example, um, if you create um, an artificial wetlands, okay, it mimics the natural system, but it's not actually, an, it's not a natural ecosystem. IUCN uh, does not recognize biomimicry in its definition of nature-based solutions. Okay, does it include, uh, the second part to this, does it include sustainable management and ecosystem restoration? Um, so if you look at both definitions, IUCNs and the ECs, yes, it does. And it was one of the icons in the, um, in the infographic I showed you. Um, yes, the Nepal uh, example of community forestry is an excellent example that I have also used in many of our presentations. Um, and also with Sanjay, uh, we actually did some work with, I had a master's student who studied uh, over the years, uh, how community forestry in Nepal has uh, led to reduced uh, erosion and reduced landslide occurrence, actually. So yes, I think the community forestry in Nepal can be an excellent example because it provides multiple benefits to the population, as well as at least for shallow landslide uh, cover and erosion, it seems to have been uh, quite successful. Of course, it had some uh, issues. I think community forestry is not completely 100% rosy and equitable for all communities, but overall, it's a good example. Uh, okay, Karin, uh, please be with us. I will back to you. Indrajit, are you there? Yes. Okay. Yes, so, um, uh, I think there's a question from Upendra Baral. You have partly answered, uh, but I'll read the question first. I think it's better if you can address it. So he's saying that uh, he thinks migration from rural areas to urban areas is for employment. As you mentioned, the urban is vulnerable to disaster, but how you link the population and the disaster, which is the fundamental question. At the same time, don't you think there is a lack of proper planning to mitigate the damage due to natural disaster? And in this 21st century, where the scientists working on GRM are developing new techniques and technologies to aware the population. And then connection with that, if there is a reoccurrence of disaster, then why the policymakers are not hearing or implementing this DRM uh, planners or workers or scientists voice. There's a problem in South Asia, uh, not only in South Asia, but he uh, focused on South Asia. So in your idea, what have to do in the policymakers to hear the voices of uh, DRR and DRM professionals or eco DRR professionals. Inajit, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Upendra. It's a nice question. I partly answered that in the chat box. The, the, the point is like uh, uh, since 2007, global population is mostly right now staying in, in urban areas than rural areas. So that means like the rural population is increasing due to particular reason. The reasons are not only uh, the population is migrating uh, to the city from the rural areas, there are a few reasons for that. One, one of the reasons is the livelihood and also the services. So why people are, so these are, these are the points actually we are considering uh, as a underlying risk factors that possibly is one of the things are poverty, education services, health services, and all other facilities. So these are not very much available in the rural areas uh, because of the centralized policy. So we are not, uh, decentralizing everything, all services in equally or, or uh, equity is not there in that context. So because of that, one is the population pressure is, uh, pressure is going to the uh, city too much. So that is one of the reasons more and more population, I also mentioned in my presentation, the more and more populations are in, uh, increasingly exposed to the uh, upcoming hazards and that become uh, in, in after some time become disasters. Now your question is why uh, the governance system is not addressing that. There is a lack between the scientific groups and the government groups. Means the decision makers are not well equipped in terms of the information or maybe there is a lack from the scientific community also to communicate in the decision makers language. I was working with the government of India for about eight years uh, in, with the decision making uh, groups uh, for uh, to, to develop their capacity at the national level. 
So where we have seen like there is a there is a serious gap not in, only in the Asian countries. It's also true for other countries as well. The risk communication from one group to another group is not that much. With scientists are more busy with the uh, with the projects and the result of the project and the research outcomes in terms of the paper and journals. But how many of the journals are read by the administrator to understand? Is only the scientific uh, team or scientific community who who are uh, reading and and referring to the journals. Very few of the components of the hardcore research or the scientific research are percolating down to the lab to land concept. So I think there is a gap. We need to take some initiative to make a more understandable way uh, to, to make the governance system aware about the process. So, so that could be implemented. So it's, it's not only gap from one side, it's I think gap from both sides. It's our responsibility also as a scientist to make things more, more uh, sort of convenient and, and uh, understandable for the uh, decision makers. So these are the response I think uh, will be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, Indraji, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, quite uh, you know important that uh, the scientists also have to show some successful examples uh, showing to the policy makers that, oh, guys, look here, that you know if we implement these kind of things, then we can change the you know the society and we can do the sustainable risk reduction and that's uh, you know quite uh, important point so i would like to request our participant please post your question within 5 minutes and then after we'll uh, stop uh, taking question so in the meantime uh, i will uh, take a question uh, of sarad mananda um, uh, yeah it's question for i think uh, karin how much role of land use planning plays in resilient urban planning in the context of Nepal, consisting of the land covered by rugged hill with uh, ecological diversities and fragile geological topography prone to natural hazards and uh, climate or water induced disasters. Karin, do you have any thoughts on it? Yes, I'm happy to take this question. And I would, uh, with all due respect, like to correct I think it's Mr. Sharad's question. Uh, do not use the term natural disasters, please, sir, <laughs> because I don't believe there is such a thing as natural disasters. And that helps to answer the question, is that it plays a huge role. One of the studies that we were working on with uh, Dr. Basanta and uh, with, uh, with, with Sanjay Devkota was looking at the fact that uh, roads in Nepal are probably uh, linked to 40% of landslides. Okay, so that means that the way we build roads in very fragile slopes has a huge um, occurrence. It can actually create more risk. So land use planning is extremely important uh, in terms of, of course, people need to eat. They, they need to find livelihoods. Um, but most of the terraces built in Nepal that are well-maintained have actually uh, been found to, in many cases, and Basanta, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but in many cases, they have actually uh, managed their, their way of managing landslides. Some of the good, uh, the good terrace practices the Nepal uh, people have managed over uh, thousands of years. Um, I mean, oftentimes uh, people learn how to live with landslides and manage it, but the new occurrence of building the bulldozer roads has created a many more landslides, okay? So this has to do with proper land use planning, uh, making sure to properly manage the water. And um, Basanta managed the eco-safe roads concept that we have been working on with uh, base, mainly, uh, mainly thanks to Sanjay. If Kota has been how to do the proper bioengineering, but properly managing the water, properly managing um, too much, so much water coming during the monsoon time. So I would say that it's critical. You have one of the best examples of community-based forestry in the world. How did you manage it? You manage it by setting up uh, community-based forest user groups. rules on who should attend, and the rules are very strict, right, for how to manage the forest. The same should go for land use planning at the municipality level. You should have somehow better checks and balances to make sure that your municipalities are properly managing the land use plans that they often already have in place. So this is what I would encourage you is to follow up with your municipalities to, to 
make sure that they're following and enforcing our plans. Thank you. Thank you. Over. Uh, uh, thanks, Karin. Uh, Suraj, can you make uh, Sanjay Devkota my uh, microphone turn on? So in the meantime, yeah, Karin, uh, you are right. You know, the study we have done in 2018 shows that, you know, most of the landslides, you know, is, is small scale landslides, they are caught, uh, uh, you know, nearby the road, uh, especially uh, what we studied in uh, Sindhupal statistics. Um, um, yeah, you know, but one thing uh, I just wanted to ask you about, you have, you know, you have been working around the globe and you have done your you know, extensive work in the Nepal, Himalaya, EcoSafe Road, Hill Road, uh, you know, different things. And this monsoon has, you know, uh, created really a big uh, uh, issue here in Nepal, uh, you know, coupling with this uh, earthquake in Nepal and people are again talking about, oh, no, you know, uh, road only, doesn't create landslides. You know, what we have seen that there are lots of landslides which actually started from the forest, uh, especially from the community forest which is nearby the villages and people are still thinking, oh, we preserved or conserved the forest and now again, we are receiving lots of landslide from that. So it's kind of, you know, uh, discussion going on and uh, this is used in Nepal. Do you have any observation on that, Karin? Well, studies for countries, uh, interestingly enough, have shown that it's also around 40% that come from uh, from roads, actually, Santa G. So other uh, studies that we have quoted also quote around 40% of landslides in uh, India and other places also. Um, now, of course, uh, if a slope is so full of water and so much water has come down, it probably doesn't matter how much forest cover there, but all I can say is if there were no forest cover, imagine the devastation would be even worse, right? Uh, so um, all I can say is that there might be some cases where, yeah, the landslide may have started um, in a forest area, but I bet you there was some kind of disturbance in that forest. It's quite unusual for a landslide to start in an area that is completely untouched, uh, but I mean, okay, it might happen. There may have been some kind of um, source there, some kind of uh, other um, hydrological reason why a landslide started there. But the science says that uh, it's often due uh, to human activity that where we have some triggering of landslides. But of course, a huge, huge cloudburst may not stop anything, right? From no, no trees might stop landslide in a, in a cloudburst situation. Yeah. Yeah, Karin. So thank you very much. Now I'd like to invite um, um, Sanjay Devkota because uh, he has uh, extensive experiences on uh, this, uh, you know, bioengineering, eco GRR, eco safe road construction. You know, he has done his uh, extensive work on his uh, PhD about uh, the effectiveness of different uh, uh, plants uh, using the tensile strength and hydrological behaviors in Panchasa region, uh, which is a famous, uh, you know, uh, watershed, Pewa watershed uh, uh, in Kaski district, Pokhara, Nepal. So, uh, uh, Sanjay, sir, can you just share uh, one or two minutes uh, your views on this? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, uh, Dr. Basanta, and hello to you all uh, attending this workshop from different parts of the world. I'm very happy to share my ideas, and it's, it's really very complicated working with the soil and the water, right? So it is, it is not that hardcore engineering, it is complicated science. And more recently, we are talking about nature-based uh, solution here in Nepal, and we are also a part of this nature-based solution. Uh, more recently, in the last week, I was in the field with the UNDP supported some landslide assessment and design of mitigation measures. What I have observed in the field was that the, many of the landslides were triggered by ro rural roads. Yeah, yes, Karen, Karen said that, yeah, our study at the past studies indicated that the landslide triggered by the rural roads in Nepal was about 40%. Of course, that's true. But things have been changing recently because of the intense rainfall. This year is really very hard rain here in Nepal. The hillside, the steep slopes, and the shallow soil, those are the main factors that has triggered a lot of landslide. And the rural roads have a significant impact. In the same time, as Dr. Basant said, 
the landslides were triggered in the middle of the forest. That's true in some points. There are many landslides where also we can see uh, in the middle, middle of the forest. So, so if this is the case, then why we are going again talking about the nature-based solution? The reason is that the landslide triggered in the middle of the region is because of we are growing forest without considering the, the uh, topographical features of the region. When there is a, a shallow soil and we are growing big trees in the, in the, in the steep slope, obviously the, the trees will uh, edit the load on the slope and eventually there is an intensive rainfall in the mountainous area and that has triggered the landslide. So uh, now we need to think in different way, the tree species, the trees, not only the trees, but also other species, the grass and shrubs and things like that. We have to uh, promote different species depending on the topography, uh, the geomorphology of the region. So we need to be a more precise on that. If we do promote the grass or shrubs in the steep slopes, then, then the slope will be less vulnerable in terms of shallow line slide. So it is complicated. So we can talk a lot about these points, uh, but of course the nature-based solution is becoming one of the sustainable way of conserving the soil and water. Uh, yeah, in, in the context of Nepal, the rural roads is a big, becoming a big problem. Uh, Recently, there are a lot of landslides triggered by the rural roads. So the main reason behind this is the unplanned construction. These are the really very unplanned roads here in the hill areas of Nepal. If we do the road construction in proper way, there should not be that much of landslide. So these are the things, the planning, the land use plan is very important as Karen said. This is a very, very important point that we have to consider in the context of Nepal and other part of the world as well. So my point is that the land use plan is very, very important that we have recently, my, I'm recently preparing a proposal for the risk sensitive land use planning for some of the municipal, municipalities in the Nepal. So now things have been changing. The government and the, the development partners are considering the risk sensitive land use plan. This is very important for the sustainable uh, development and the better livelihood in the hilly terrain of Nepal. That's it for the moment. And maybe if we need, we can talk a lot, lot more about this point, the, this issues later. Uh, thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sanjay, sir. Uh, uh, there's another question uh, in Facebook uh, for Karin. Uh, but before that, uh, Dr. Indrajit Paul has to leave uh, for another important and emergency meeting which just uh, recently uh, turned up. So Dr. Paul, thank you very much for joining yeah. us and we hope uh, uh, we'll talk later uh, in some other days and work together again. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. All the best. Please continue. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. So uh, there's another question uh, for Karin. So Karin mentioned about Sivapuri National Park. So the question is from, uh, Chiranjivi Bhattrai. So Karin mentioned about the Sivapuri National Park where payment of ecosystem services is implemented. So some dams and ponds are proposed, constructed upstream under the Bagmati watershed program. Do you think these are the nature-based solutions, Karin? Any thoughts on that? Dams and ponds are being created, huh? Uh, this yeah. is the example. Well, uh, certainly ponds. Um, we have from Kerala examples and what we are working also is water conservation ponds, which is a kind of a um, biomimicry in a way, as a kind of way of water in an area. Uh, dams can be controversial and um, I think it really depends on the situation. In many countries where it's uh, drylands, uh, in drylands areas where water management really is very critical, um, dams can actually provide a really good way of managing water and one of the only ways for uh, some uh, people to gain livelihoods. Um, but of course dams, depending on the situation, can also inundate areas. Um, but uh, we know that there are many uh, good micro hydropower stations in Nepal uh, which are based on uh, some dams. 
In some cases, uh, there is interruption, though, of the natural flow of the ecosystem, so that needs to be properly managed. Uh, but yeah, it can be what we call a hybrid solution, right? Where um, yep. there is uh, smaller dams that are created and creates an opportunity for uh, water uh, to be managed. But I would not like to say a blanket statement that all dams are good because that's not what I want to say, but it depends on the situation where there can be a good hybrid solution. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Karin. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, still a you know, really good uh, question because if we use the local resources like uh, dam preparation that what we do in the, uh, in the lowland construction or protection from the flood, sometimes we can consider natural based solution. But if we use more uh, cement and you know more concrete and others, then yeah, there there, there can be say uh, the hybrid techniques, uh, you know, uh, or mix up techniques, mix up hard and soft engineering techniques. Uh, yes, wonderful uh, question uh, from Chiran Um so I think I'll stop here taking questions and thank you very much for our participant for wonderful questions. And this is really nice. And uh, these questions are really, you know, indicating that we are working on natural based solution. And uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, Karin and Indrajit for their wonderful presentation. Um, so now uh, I will hand over uh, to Suras to continue further. Suras, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Basanda. Uh, is Karen still available? Yes. Uh, so, so maybe she, uh, she might share some final remarks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dr. Karen, do you have anything to say? Uh, uh, yeah. to well, I would just like to thank uh, for the, uh, thank all participants for the wonderful questions. Uh, they uh, were very good. That means that you were listening and challenging us a bit. So that's uh, fantastic. I'm just sorry that we cannot interact more uh, in person. Uh, but we'll come ahead. At the same time, this is a good uh, way to interact with you because uh, it has lower carbon footprint than us traveling to Nepal. Uh, but in any case, I thank you again for the opportunity to interact with you. And um, I hope that you can all uh, visit our website, petter.org, and sign up for our new weekly newsletter. And that way we'll give you more information on our upcoming Massive Open Online course, which will start uh, in January. Uh, tell a friend about it. And uh, thanks again, and hope to see you somewhere in the world uh, again soon. And stay safe, everybody. And thank you so much, Dr. Karin. And uh, also, thank you so much, Dr. Basanta, for the excellent moderation, as always. Uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Indrajit Paul sir, for the wonderful review on sustainable development, uh, resilient communities, uh, uh, challenges and opportunities in the Asia Pacific. It was really good to see the number of case studies and projects like Living Deltas and so on. And yes, we also like to thank our Dr. Karen uh, for her interesting insights on the opportunities for exploring nature-based solutions to DRR, urban DRR challenges. It was really interesting to see the number of case studies and even from our Nepal. And uh, yes, uh, it was really uh, a good example that um, contrast uh, between the uh, that high T case study. So yes, we need to think up uh, and yes, we need to aim for the sustainability. And yes, uh, we would also like to thank Dr. Sanjay, uh, sir, for the wonderful remarks and uh, some of the works which he, ha which he has been uh, doing around. And yes, we had a, a very interesting Q&A session with the number of quality questions. And we tried uh, our best to address all of these questions from our Facebook page live uh, streaming and also from our Zoom chat box. In case you have any further queries, please feel free to mail us at info at inhrr.org. Uh, I would also like to convey my big thanks to all of our organizing team, speakers, session moderator, our distinguished guests and participants for participating in this session. The session was really informative and interactive. Uh, we'll be sharing the recorded session uh, um, on the YouTube channel and the links will be forwarded to the registered email. So meanwhile, I have something to share uh, regarding our upcoming webinars. So we'll be having uh, uh, we have uh, we'll be having a scheduled webinar uh, that will be uh, conducted this uh, 
Sunday, September 28. Uh, and the, the topic is related to the hydropower in the Himalayas, a risky endeavor by Dr. Wolfgang Squangwart, who is a research associate at University of Potsdam, Institute of Earth and Environment uh, Science, Germany. Uh, similarly, I would also like to share one more uh, information regarding our upcoming webinar, uh, which will be conducted tomorrow. It is a national level webinar, uh, uh, which will be conducted at 1 p.m. Nepal time. And it is uh, jointly organized by the Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction with Nepal Engineers Association, Bhagwati province. So we'll be talking on the disaster risk management in Nepal, issues and challenges. And for this, we'll be having Professor Dr. Taranidhi Bhatrai from Trishandra campus, uh, Engineer Rajan Raj Pandey from, uh, he, he's a WAS expert and former Joint Secretary of Ministry of Water Supply and Engineer Anil Pokhrel sir, uh, who is CEO at National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Authority. Uh, so yes, we'll be having some interesting uh, talks tomorrow and on Sunday as well. So I would like to warmly welcome you all. And we'd also like to request our participant to please fill up the feedback survey form. And also, uh, we are also uh, requesting for the uh, uh, suggestions on the future webinar topics. And this topic on the nature-based solution was also highly demanded uh, suggestions from the feedback form. So we have addressed this uh, request and we'll also be addressing such a request in the future. And we'd also like to mention that IHRR will be more than happy to collaborate and organize this kind of relevant webinar in the days to come. So with this, I would like to uh, sign up from our session for today. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you so much. Namaste. Please stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Namaste. Bye-bye.